Good afternoon. Yes. Um, so I'm going to begin today our last event where we started in our first event uh, with this quote from Black Studies poet philosopher Fred Moten uh, in his book with Stefan O'Harney, The Undercommons. Study is what you do with other people. It's talking and walking around with other people, working, dancing, suffering, some irreducible convergence of all three held under the name of speculative practice. So welcome to the Black Studies Open University, the spring event series of the Abolition Democracy Fellows Program, of the Black Studies Collaboratory housed in the Department of African American Studies here at UC Berkeley. Today's program, Sacred Larder, Uplifting the Histories and Memories of Traditional Food Preservation Techniques in the Black Community, has been curated by Abolition Democracy Artist Fellow Bryant Terry. And it's the last of nine events in our Black Studies Open University Spring Series. Um, uh, my name is Lee Rayford. I'm professor of African American Studies. <laughs> and along with Dr. Tiana Espichel, <laughs> yes, director of the Black Studies Collaboratory. And I'm really missing Tiana today because Tiana usually does the uh, emotional work of crying for both of us. Um, and so I, I might be forced to, like, actually, I might break down today. Um, <laughs> so the BSC is a three-year initiative to explore and amplify the world-building work of black studies. With generous funding from the Andrew Mellon Foundation's Just Futures grant, we have, over the course of the first two and a half years, welcomed artists, activists, archivists, and elders into the campus community. We have produced a robust event series like this one in partnership with units on campus across the bay, around the bay and across the country. We have awarded some 30 grants of about $5,000 each to students, faculty, and staff supporting innovative, black-centered, collaborative projects, more than a third of which involve collaboration with off-campus partners. We have supported the research and development of more than two dozen black feminist scholars around the country and across the globe. And we are building long-term partnerships with black-centered Bay Area organizations that are doing phenomenal work in health, education, art, and food justice. I am deeply, deeply proud of what we have accomplished. And you can find out more about our work at our website, Black Studies Collab at berkeley.edu. So we're here at the Berkeley Art Museum, at the threshold of UC Berkeley and the city of Berkeley. We are sited on the territory of the Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chechenyo-speaking Ohlone. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land, both town and gown. In acknowledging the Ohlone history of this land, we acknowledge that the Ohlone people are thriving members of the Berkeley community who are actively imagining more just futures and engaging the tools that are needed to do that, work, that imaginative work. One way to make concrete such acknowledgement is through the payment of Shumi land tax, a material way for non-indigenous people living in the East Bay to participate in the rematriation of the land to ind indigenous people. And you can find out more about Shumi through their website, uh, through the Sagareate Land Trust, their website. So this series, the Black Studies Open University, has been an effort to better understand the history and future of black life on stolen lands. And if you've come to any of our events, you've heard me say that this program is a commitment to black studies as a public good. 
You've heard me say that we take our name from the Open University UK, spearheaded by the late, great Stuart Hall. Yes, Ashe, whose work provides an example of the pinnacle of intellectual pursuits pursuit, uh, performed for the public and in the public interest. And you've heard me say that we're inspired by the legacy of community campus pedagogical partnerships, like the Afro-American Association reading groups of the 1960s, the undergraduate-led Demo uh, undergraduate democratic education co uh, CAL courses, the DECAL courses, by SNCC's Freedom Schools, by the political education classes and community schools of the Black Panther Party, and if you were here last month, by the uh, Black Panther Community School. So too is the Black Studies Open University a recognition that knowledge is produced, circulated, and put into use in a range of locations, from the kitchen table to the seminar room, from the street corner to the concert stage, from the prison cell to the lecture podium, and as we'll hear today, from the farm to the art museum. So study is what you do with other people. Whew. So I end our series where I began, in order to help us take stock of the time we've spent here. We have talked and walked together, we have worked, we have danced, we have grieved. So too have we practiced new languages, shared stories, most of them true, <laughs> spit bars, plotted our escapes, and reaffirmed our commitments. Above all, the Black Studies Open University has engaged in a mode of study that is always social and necessarily collaborative. Collaboration, we like to say, following our, one of our activist fellows from last year, Zach Norris, collaboration is necessary for our survival. We have dreamt together and practiced for new, more just ways of living. So before I turn the podium over to Bryant Terry, I want to thank the beautiful, beautiful collective of people who've made today and this entire series possible. It has been a joy and weirdly maybe a dream of mine to partner, to host this event here at the Berkeley Art Museum um, and Pacific Film Archive. So I want to thank BAMFA, helmed by director Julie rodriguez Widom and the Osher Theater team, who've been fantastic. <laughs> Nat Rees, Dave Taylor, Taylor McAllister, Taylor Coburn, and the entire staff. Um, I want to thank Barbara, <laughs> BSC project manager extraordinaire, who I don't even know where you are because you are everywhere all at once. You don't even know how much you make possible. I want to thank BSC graduate student assistants, Francesca Araujo and Alexandra Gassese. I want to thank um, the Department of African American Studies, helmed brilliantly by Chair Professor Nikki Jones, with incredible staff support from Sandy Richmond, Maria Eredia, and Lindsay Villarreal. I want to thank our ASL interpreters for today, Alina to my left, and Dresden from Pro Bono ASL. I want to thank the Andrew Mellon Foundation. We'll keep it moving. Um, I want to thank all of the Abolition Democracy Fellows for this year and last year, but this year, what you have done, what you have dreamed, what you have curated has just been electrifying. I want to thank today's panelists, Ms. Beatrice Terry, Joshua Gabriel, Kanchan Don Hunter, Will Scott Jr., and Pandora Thomas. We thank you for making the time to join us. I um, also want to thank Greg Niemeyer and the Department of Art Practice who partnered with us to provide Bryant studio space and a really incredible art community. Uh, I want to thank Bryant Terry and his undergraduate research assistant, Jessica Allen. I want to thank the ancestors who are with us always. 
thank you here today for joining us, for making time. Um, and of course, thank you again to Bryant. Now, Bryant Terry is an award-winning author, publisher, community builder, and artist defined by the fluidity with which his practices move between cooking, writing, curating, bookmaking, conceptualism, social sculpture, music, and design. Brian is the founder and editor-in-chief of Four Color Books, an imprint of Ten Speed Press and Penguin Random House, which collaborates with the most forward-thinking and groundbreaking BIPOC chefs, writers, artists, activists, and innovators to craft visually stunning nonfiction books. He's also the author of six critically acclaimed books, and he has won a James Beard Award, an NAACP Award, an Art of Eating Prize for his work. His latest book, Black Food, which is um, for sale in the, the Bamfa bookstore, if you, if you don't already have it, although I feel like I'm looking at a crowd who probably owns every copy of the book. Um, Black Food is a gorgeous collection of recipes, stories, and art from over 100 contributors throughout the African diaspora. It was the most critically acclaimed American cookbook published in 2021. Brian, we get to, Brian's gonna be here for a minute, which is great. Brian um, will begin an MFA program in art practice here at UC Berkeley this fall. He graduated from the chef's training program at the Nat uh, Natural Gourmet Institute for Health and Culinary Arts in New York City. And he is a former PhD student who holds an MA in history with an emphasis on the a African diaspora from N NYU where he studied under historian Robin D.G. Kelly. So when Tiana and I were imagining who we would love to be in conversation with through the fellows program, Brian was always at the top of the list. Um, but, you know, we thought the chances he would say yes were pretty slim. You know, he's busy with multiple ventures, he just launched his book imprint, uh, he's big time. Um, but we asked anyway, because Tiana and I are try we try to practice our own dreaming. Um, and because even if Brian said no, we wanted him to know the impact he's had on our thinking. Um, uh, and that is um, true of all of our fellows, um, the impact you've had on, on our thinking and our living. We asked also because like all of our visiting fellows, we wanted to offer the conditions of care where they might experiment and take risks uh, and open up worlds with us together. We asked because you never know where your question might find someone. And we were really fortunate that our, our ask found Bryant in a really special time. We are so grateful, so grateful, Bryant, that you accepted our invitation and that you brought your whole, whole self with you, especially those parts that you weren't right, quite ready to share yet. It's been a really special year, and we are thrilled to be concluding this program, this series, with you, Bryant, um, and with you all today. As you know, our program ends promptly at 2.30, and we'll need to vacate the theater, but we invite folks to continue our study and break bread together in the atrium just outside the theater. Um, we'll have a closing reception celebrating the end of the series with a menu co-created by Bryant and Chef Lala Harrison. And with that, please join me in welcoming Brian Taylor. Margie, my maternal grandmother kept a cupboard in her kitchen that was about seven feet tall and a foot deep, each shelf crowded with glass jars full of preserves, pickle pears, peaches, carrots, green beans, figs, blackberry jam, sauerkraut, and her not-to-be-forgotten chow chow. 
cabbage, onions, tomatoes, peppers, chopped finely, cooked until the vegetables are tender, then served as a relish with leafy greens, collards, mustards, turnips, kale, dandelions. Listen, my grandmother would work magic in the kitchen. You knew she was cooking whenever you entered her house, even if you didn't smell it, because you'd always hear singing. Glory, glory, hallelujah. When I lay my burden down, burden down, no more Monday, no more Tuesday. When I lay my burden down. Whenever she rolled out the dough for her fried pies, it felt like her love and connection to spirit were being folded in along with the flour, salt, butter, and water. I've been sharing this, this, my favorite childhood memory, since I started presenting publicly about health, food, and farming issues over 20 years ago. My work has always had the texture of autobiography, and it is important that I ground all my practices in history and memory. My fondest recollections of being in the kitchen involve spending time with my maternal grandmother, from whom I gained a fondness of cooking, but most of the lessons that I learned as a child about the ways that my ancestors grew food came from spending time with my paternal grandfather, Andrew Johnson Terry, in his backyard urban farm in Memphis, Tennessee. His elders who had farms in rural Mississippi passed down their agrarian knowledge, connection to the land, emphasis on self-determination, and practices of generosity, community care, and mutual aid to meet the immediate needs of neighbors and the wider community. I give thanks to my grandparents for laying the foundation for the work that I've done for more than two decades. I give thanks to all those who helped make today possible. My blood, intellectual, and artistic ancestors, my parents, Beatrice and Booker Terry, my in-laws, Marilyn Wong and Wang Sang Kun, my collaborator on the visual data series, which I'll share with you later in the presentation, Robert Trujillo, my creative comrade and collaborator for over two decades, Joshua Gabriel, my fabricator slash collaborators on the Sacred Larder work, which I'll share with you later, Matt Austin and Oriana Corin, who are based in Los Angeles, the farmers with whom I'm working on the Sacred Larder work, who are also panelists today, Will Scott Jr., Conchin Don Hunter, and Pandora Thomas, Barbara Montano, and Lee Rayford. Barbara, your tireless work holding everything together and supporting all the fellows since last fall is invaluable, and I could not have pulled any of this off without your help. When I was practicing, this is where I broke down. When I was practicing at home, I told my wife, I hopefully I get all the crying out the way at home, but I don't know, it's welling up. Um, <laughs> Dr. Rayford, words cannot adequately express how grateful I am for your invitation to be an artist fellow this academic year. I say this without exaggeration. This has been a life-changing experience. And I'm so honored that you've seen and supported me. From honoring my commitment to community development and transformative change at the UC Berkeley Renaissance Gala, to inviting me to give the keynote at the Cal Black graduation ceremony. <laughs> You've held space for my per Okay. I'm cool. I'm good. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> You've held space for my potential to continue to growing as a creative person and a community builder for more than a decade. I thank you so much, Dr. Rayford. <laughs> to all the BSC fellows, it's been one of the most intellectually enriching and fulfilling periods of my adult life, being in community with you this academic year. My undergraduate research assistant, Jessica Allen, for all your hard work. <laughs> Supporting my art practices and for seeing me and holding the highest vision for my success in this new phase of my work. 
my personal assistant and Wynn Hughes for always holding things down and keeping me on point. I'd be a mess without you, <laughs> period. <sighs> my wife, best friend and highest um, and biggest patron over the <laughs> Jadon Terry Coon. <laughs> And our daughters, Mila and Zinzi, who we had considered bringing today, but I was like, no, y'all going to school. Um, <laughs> y'all are my everything. Last but not least, I'd like to thank, give a major shout out to Greg Niemeyer, professor in the Department of Art, pra Art Practice, for supporting throughout this fellowship. Thank you for getting me a studio among the MFA students, which allowed me to dream, ideate, and manifest projects I've envisioned for years, as well as new ones. Thank you for encouraging me to apply for the MFA program during a studio visit after I talked myself out of it one week before the application was due. Thank you for your vision and leadership in our department. I have to admit it was scary for me pivoting into the contemporary art space. I thought I was too old to learn new practices. I thought people would keep me boxed into their vision of how I showed up as a creative and change maker. I thought I had peaked. I'd like to quickly shout out three important people who gave me the courage to move into this new phase of my creative life and apply for the MFA program once I stopped playing small and understood that the universe will support me being expansive and continuing to grow. Oh, that was supposed to be up the whole time. <laughs> See, crimes are distractive. Um, Nell Irvin Painter, Oakland native, Professor Emerita of American History at Princeton University, an artist who at 64 decided to go to art school, first attending Mason Grove School of the Arts at Rutgers for a BFA, and then Rhode Island School of Design for an MFA. Melvin Van Peebles, <laughs> polymath, writer, filmmaker, actor, musician, composer, entrepreneur. This is a picture of Melvin, his son Mario, and me at the Hollywood Farmer Market. <laughs> Those are carrots, by the way. <laughs> At the Hollywood Farmer's Market in 2009, after spending the weekend with their family filming for a multi-episode series called Mario's Greenhouse, Melvin offered me two pieces of advice while we were hanging out. One, keep my overhead low so I have the freedom to live the creative life I deserve. And two, don't ever let the world put me into a box that restricts my creative expression. My Uncle Don Bryant, my creative and artistic impulses come from my mom's family. My maternal grandmother, grandfather, Edward Bryant, founded and led Eddie Bryant and the Four Stars of Harmony, a traveling gospel quartet he founded in the 1950s. He passed down his musical talent and love of the art form to all his children, from my mom, who was a musical minister at our church, to my Uncle Don, who was a house songwriter for the famed soul music label High Records, pinning some of their label's biggest hits, including I Can't Stand the Rain, by his wife, I should say, I Can't Stand the Rain, uh, by his wife, Ann Peebles. In 2017, Uncle Don released his second secular album since 1966, Don't Give Up on Love. Two years later, he released his third secular album, You Make Me Feel, which was nominated for a Grammy in the traditional blues category the following year when my uncle was 79 years old. Growing up, I was always inspired by Uncle Don, knowing that it was possible for one to live a comfortable life being a creative person. But seeing him continue to kill it, going into his 80s, let me know that there is nothing that can stop me from growing and evolving over the next several decades. So in honor of one of my biggest inspirations, Here's a short clip of my uncle sitting in the pocket, performing a nickel and a nail by his former label mate, Ovi Wright. Give a count of 
is a nickel and a nail. Woo! <laughs> I'd like to talk about the arc of my journey as a chef, food justice activist, and community builder and highlight the way in which my work has united art, culture, and social impact for more than two decades. Before I talk about my own work, I want to talk about two major influences that moved me to become a food justice activist. And by becoming a food justice activist, I mean turning into the most self-righteous, dogmatic, judgmental <laughs> vegan that you, whatever your image is as a finger wagon vegan, this was a period I went through after these two creative expressions just changed the game for me. Sorry, mom and dad. I know, I was a jerk. Um, <laughs> pictured here is a seminal hip hop group, Boogie Down Productions, who are masters at weaving in social and political issues into their music. The song Beef from their album Edutainment brilliantly describes the way in which our industrialized food system brutalizes animals, negatively impacts individual and public health, and economically incentivizes corporations to continue these violent and unethical practices. So I'll kick some lyrics from the first verse for you. And it goes a little something like this. Beef, what a relief. When will this poisonous product cease? This is another public service announcement. You can believe it or you can doubt it. Let us begin now with the cow, the way that it gets to your plate and how. The cow doesn't grow fast enough for a man, so through his greed, he creates a faster plan. He has drugs to make the cow grow quicker. Through the stress, the cow gets sicker. 21 different drugs are pumped into the cow in one big lump. And just before it dies, it cries in a slaughterhouse full of germs and flies. It gets much more graphic, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Soon after, I read The Jungle, a work of narrative fiction by Upton Sinclair in which he exposes the horrific working conditions and unsanitary state of the meatpacking industry in Chicago. So it was not a scholarly monograph or a heady intellectual lecture that radically shifted my habits, attitudes, and politics regarding food. It was a song and a novel. When I ruminate on the impact of, that Upton Sinclair, a journalist and creative writer, and Kara as one, an MC, had on my life's trajectory, I understand them to be agents of social change. They and many other artists, storytellers, media makers, and cultural influencers served as a model for how I approach food justice activism. As a graduate student in history, my research on radical movements of the 60s and 70s led me to the survival programs of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. Two of their more than 60 programs that were aimed at meeting basic needs of historically marginalized communities programmatically addressed the intersection of poverty, malnutrition, and institutional racism, their grocery giveaways, and their free breakfast for children program pictured here. I was also deeply moved by the artwork of Emory Douglas, the Black Panther Party's Minister of Culture. My framework for, framework for understanding cooking as a political act came from reading Dr. Robin D.G. Kelly's second scholarly monograph, Race Rebels in which he examines the methods of resistance adopted by the black working class in the 20th century to resist capitalism and white supremacy. Slowdowns, theft, leaving work early, quitting on the spot. While the food justice movement engages in organized forms of resistance, I think it is equally important that we uplift and celebrate seemingly apolitical acts such as growing food, making meals from scratch, and building community around our home tables as highly political, dare I say radical, in an industrialized food system controlled by a handful of multinational corporations who spend billions of dollars encouraging us to buy food at corporate-owned supermarkets, to eat out at fast food restaurants, and to stuff our faces as quickly as possible so we can go to one low-wage job to the next one. I celebrate these everyday acts of resistance and see them as an entry point into the food justice movement for everyday people. While attending culinary school, I found it Be Healthy, a community-based organization that used cooking as a revolutionary tool to politicize and train young people living in neighborhoods that suffered food apartheid. Our goal was to empower these young people to own and drive the solutions to change to creating more access to healthful, just, sustainable, and culturally relevant food options in their communities. 
In addition to imparting cooking skills and providing training and community organizing, we brought in artists from our community to work with our young people to help them create visual counter narratives to push back against the billions of dollars that were spent by multinational food corporations to convince them to eat the worst foods and drink the worst beverages. I went on to author several book groundbreaking books that combine recipes, stories, music, and art, including my latest, Black Food, which brought together over 100 creators from the African diaspora to tell our stories in our most authentic way. FUBU, as I said to the more than 100 contributors when I was calling them for three months, inviting them to be a part of this book, for us, by us, for non-black people. Uh, <laughs> I collaborated with artists to call attention to our most pressing issues and offer sol solutions. In this series, I work with Oakland-based artist Fabiano Rodriguez to create three posters that call attention to the way in that structural racism impacts the health of black and brown communities and highlight gardening and cooking as everyday acts of resistance. As chef in residence at the Museum of the African Diaspora, I created pu public programming that centered people of color and highlighted food justice climate justice, postpartum justice, and more. So around 2001, I started attending a lot of national gatherings geared towards fixing our broken food system. I was always bothered by a few things when I showed up. There were mostly, uh, most often majority white spaces, and the people being most negatively impacted by our food system weren't in the rooms. I understood that exploited, exploited migrant farm workers, people living in rural and urban areas suffering from food apartheid and others most negatively impacted by our broken food system should have been leading the conversations. I understand that food justice activism moves beyond advocacy and direct service and calls for organized responses to food injustice by the most impacted communities. I also noted that, noticed that there were a lot of educational and class biases baked into these gatherings. The conversation started with public policy and heady intellectual ideas, but art, culture, and a focus on community were missing. The mantra that I started repeating back then was start with the visceral to, the ignite, the, to ignite the cerebral and end at the political. When I was invited to this fellowship, I knew I wanted to focus on a project that I had been thinking about for years inspired by the data visualizations created by the scholar W.E.B. Du Bois for the exhibit of American Negroes at the Paris exhibition of 1900, I took important raw data about health, food, and farming issues and brought it to life by making a series of research-based mixed media works in collaboration with my partner on this project, Robert Trujillo. So this is a mock-up of the first in this series. Um, I mean, I can get deep into like, these are gonna be on these big wooden panels and we're actually working with the woodworker to kind of create the graph, uh, maybe two, or five, two to five inches so it bumps out. I'm working with this other artist to take soil from the farm so which we're collaborating to stain the wood. So I won't get too deep into the details of like the, the, the work itself, but I'll say that, um, so this is the mock-up of the first in the series. And this work looks, looks at the precipitous decline of black farmers over the 20th century. As you can see, around 1920, we were approaching 1 million farmers. By 1997, that number had dropped to fewer than 20,000. We know that this decline is due to the historic racism by the US Department of Agriculture, as well as white supremacist terror. Black farmers make up less than 2% of the total farm operators in the US today. And we should all be enraged by this reality and the structural forces that created it. What's even more appalling is that black farmers continue to endure barriers to success because of the openly racist policies at the USDA, which continue to deny black farmers loans, subsidy payments, and other assistance to keep their businesses afloat. In addition to this, black farmers continue to endure racial terror at the hands of white supremacists. I don't know if you all heard about this big story that was um, in the news in February. There's a couple, um, Courtney and Nicole Mallory, two black farmers in El Paso County, Colorado, who've been terrorized by local white people. They've threatened them with guns. They've run them off the road. They've poisoned their li livestock. They've shot and killed their animals. And so these realities continue 
to this day. And I think it's important for us not just to be thinking about the past, but how can we address these current injustices that I think the farmers can speak to on our panel. As I mentioned earlier, the fellowship has given me the psychic space to think differently about evolving the body of work that I've created over the past two decades. And it has also given me the physical space in the form of a studio to research and experiment with different art practices. So I'll go quickly, but when I was thinking about this precipitous decline of black farmers, I thought about the kind of rise of preventable diet related illnesses over the second half of the 20th century among black people heart disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension. And it occurred to me that when we stop losing the ability to grow food and feed our people, this is an inevitable result. And I know that there are many factors that contribute to the failing health of black people, but I think it's important to realize this idea of self-determination. Growing food for ourselves, feeding our communities is something that we lose when we um, lose all these land stewards. So, Inspired by this memory of my grandmother and these traditions that were just commonplace a few generations ago among many elders of canning, pickling, preserving, fermenting, you know, taking all these foods that were often a part of the bounty during the summer and ensuring that they were put away in the larder for the winter time, I started working on this project that was inspired by those memories but also these traditional food techniques and really framing these foods as our medicine. Um, because what's the response to the rise in preventable diet-related illnesses? Um, feeding into the pharmaceutical industrial complex, which we know isn't necessarily going to heal these deep wounds, but just masking symptoms oftentimes. And so I started the practice of doing all this canning, pickling, preserving, fermenting, salting, dehydrating, all by myself. That was a part of my practice. I committed to only work from, with black farmers to get the main ingredients. Um, the black farmers actually um, all offered me soil from um, their farms. And so this is just practice. This is my studio. This is actually like back from September where I installed these floating shelves and started putting up the different um, fermented and pickles and all the things that I was creating. And to be honest with you, there was a sense of urgency to finish these projects, the sacred larder and the data visualization. But once I got um, invited into the MFA program, I was like, cool, I could just stop now. And um, <laughs> I'll spend the next two years working on these. And I, and, and I, you know, I, I would say I'll spend at least my first year working on this and with the support of my colleagues, mentors, and um, the professors in the art practice department. So I am going to now pivot to our panel discussion with three black farmers who I respect dearly, who've graciously agreed to work with me on this Sacred Larder project, and whose knowledge and wisdom and experience I think we can all learn from. So I will invite them to the stage. Mr. Scott, Conchin, Don Hunter, and Pandora Thomas. All right. Will Scott Jr. started his life in agriculture, working in fields from an early age. He went on to enjoy a 30-year career as an engineer for Pacific Bell Telephone Company before retiring and returning to his family's farm. Of his many accomplishments, including delivering a TED Talk, Will Scott Jr. is the founder of the African American Farmers Coalition a 501c3 not-for-profit organization that uses 22 acres as a demonstration farm, 
farmer training site, and space for cultivating traditional African American crops. The organization also empowers youth to learn about farming. Conchandon Hunter is a former co-director at Spiral Gardens where she served for 15 years. She is an herbalist, agroecologist, community organizer, educator, and grower. And she's currently a professor at the USF in the Urban Agriculture Department. She is a mother of three grown children, three grandchildren, and a proud earth steward. Besides all of the earth work she's done over the years, a large part of that work has been to encourage and engage folks of color, queer folks, and youth of all backgrounds in the sacred act of earth stewardship. Her understanding is that staying closely connected to the earth where everything we love and need comes from allows us to be more resilient and more deeply connected to ourselves and each other. Yes. <laughs> Pandora Thomas is a passionate global citizen who works as a caregiver for her mother and globally as a teacher, writer, designer, and speaker. With over 25 years of experience, Pandora's work emphasizes the benefits of applying ecological principles to social design. She's the founder of, and land steward at Earthseed Farm, a 14-acre solar-powered organic farm, orchard, and educational center located in Northern California. Yes, get up to Earthseed. <laughs> Founded in 2021, Earthseed is the first Afro-Indigenous all-Black-owned permaculture farm in Sonona County. And the farm is operated and rooted in Afro-Indigenous permaculture principles. Can we give a collective round of applause for all our family? Check two, check two. All right. Um, so this is not about me. This is about y'all. And you know, I have the questions as a container. And I know that so often uh, the magic of these conversations is letting them or, uh, kind of unfold organically. So we'll start with questions, but just take it wherever it needs to go. And we can do this popcorn style. But uh, one of the first things I wanted to know is who taught you the approach skills, science, and deep embodied knowledge of farming? How did you arrive at this work and the energy and flow of intention that you all uniquely bring to your work as Earth Stewards? Hello. I just want to first, I just want to say thank you for including me in this in this and the and and everything that you do and bring to this whew, to this planet you broke my heart with love <laughs> it's like Aww. so grateful for you and your work right so thank you and um anyway <laughs> <clears throat> how yeah i guess i <clears throat> i was raised by virginia farmers um, every summer we drove across country from California to Virginia to hang out with my grandparents and my, not my grandparents, I'm sorry, my aunts and uncles because my grandparents had long passed by then. Um, um, and every summer we would harvest from the kitchen garden. We would steal watermelons from my uncle's farm. We would break them open in the field and eat them warm in the sun from the ground where they grew and we would get in trouble <laughs> and then we'd have to go back to my aunt's house who grew peanuts um, in Virginia um, for many many years of her life and then <clears throat> on farms that her parents sharecropped and then the land fell into the hands of their children so these were my aunts and uncles my mother's brothers and sisters, and that's how I came to understand growing your own food, you know, makes sense. It, it, you could feed your whole family. My uncle grew watermelons, but he also grew hogs. And so every summer we'd have the full pit barbecue, the hog, going around the spit, and it's not vegan, <laughs> but, the, but it fed 
so many people and it brought us together and that's and I didn't understand that that's how I was impacted um, by growing food on the land things like that I when I had my first child I realized I can't afford you know to actually buy the organic produce and the really good quality food that I want to feed my child my first child so I just was like, okay, I need to grow some stuff. And I think it just kind of just got into me, you know. Even though I was adopted and these people weren't, weren't my actual blood relatives, they infused something in me and all the canning and storage and fermentation of foods, freezing, deep freeze, <laughs> all that stuff. That was my Aunt Y, and she, she showed us all how to do that. And we had to work for that, so... Anyway, blah, blah, blah. I feel like there's this kind of collective amnesia that we've suffered because of our industrialized food system where a lot of people have forgotten that many of our ancestors had these practices. Many of our ancestors were smallholder farmers. Many of our ancestors were growing food in kitchen gardens and canning and pickling and preserving. Just by a show of hands, you know, how many people in the audience had families who had farms in rural areas? How many folks have families who just had a kitchen garden where they were, you know, getting food, even just, you know, tomatoes and fresh herbs? Do any of you all have, like, the practices of preserving foods, canning and pickling and preserving and salting and these practices in your family? <sighs> we need to remember those. Yes. Pandora. Well, I also want to start by saying I love you, Bryant. Who would have thought 25 years ago when we met that this is where we would be. Um, I also want to start by honoring Joy Moore. Joy Moore, please raise your hand. Because you asked who's taught me. This woman took me under her wings 20 years ago, took me to my first eco farm. So I just want to honor, there's many more, but she's here. Um, also, the only reason I'm here is because all of the beings I'm about to name are at the farm. So I just want to honor um, 4,000 tree kin, the soil, the air, water, insects, and pollinators at Earthseed, Humphrey and Benny, the pigs, <laughs> Pootsie, the farm cat, Jackson Black, the dog, Lady Gray and BB, Brent, our farm manager, Rochelle, our operations manager, Malika, our abundant steward, Abby, our herb diva, Fernando, our site steward, Liliana, Kadeem, my assistant, and Tomas, who's been at our farm for 30 years. So I just want to honor all of them, because again, the only reason I can be here is because they're, they're doing the work. Um, and I had to take notes like you. So I would say Sankofa, too, is this um, kind of going back and fetching it. My family also were sharecroppers. I don't like that word, sharecropping, because there was no sharing. <laughs> it's more like indentured enslavement cropping <laughs> in Chiraw, South Carolina. So my mom left that farm, which, again, was like, they was living very poor. They didn't have anything, and they had to have side hustles. So they were working someone's land. In order to buy the food from the farm, they had to have side hustles. So when they left Chira to move to Pennsylvania, that was coming up for them. So they wanted to leave behind all of that. It was pain. However, my mother Frances and my dad still instilled in me this love of the earth, this passion. So I want to honor them. We used to go fishing. And the simple notion of catching a fish, going home and learning how to cut it up and, and eat it, kind of started my mind understanding that food just doesn't come from a box. I wasn't into vegetables growing up, I would be real, but I was into this idea that I started to understand and see, you know, my mom was planting, she loved plants, um, and my dad would harvest dandelions in the backyard, and then with the fishing, so I really want to honor them, and that sharecropping didn't rip that mm -hmm. from them. Okay, before we get started, I have to ask Brian a question. <laughs> I'm serious. The dirt that I gave you, did you find a five ounce gold nugget? <laughs> Mr. Scott, if I, found a, if I found a five ounce gold nugget, I would not be sitting on this stage. <laughs> 
be chilling somewhere on the island, not working no more. So, um, so I got, I got. Can I get, a, can I get a couple more buckets of soda? From you? Oh, <laughs> no, now that we kind of warm up a little bit, uh, I think to answer the first question too is that we have to go back. Is that uh, uh, my great 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 grandfather and his family, after emancipation proclamation was passed, they migrated out of South Carolina to Texas. In Texas, I, I'm told that they was a storekeeper. But my grandfather, I guess when he got there, he must have been about seven years old. This is back, I think, in uh, 1875, I believe it was. But anyway, uh, he was a sharecropper. My father sharecropped with him, so I, I got it on the tail end of it, sharecropping. And you have to understand, too, is that in slavery, a person is owned by uh, another individual. In sharecropping, you are owned by that individual's land, which is still just an updated version of slavery. Mm -hmm. um, my memory is this, is that too, is that being a young, young kid is that uh, we live so far in the country that they call it the bottom. I mean, I would, uh, on my birth certificate it says, uh, Ida Bell, Oklahoma is my birthplace. But I can tell you is that when we made a trip to Ida Bell, it took a half a day you know, to get there. So we live out, out in the, in the, in the woods. But to me, it coming up as a kid is I thought it actually was the Garden of Eden yeah. <laughs> because I had everything that I needed. I had a mother and a father, and then also I had all the food that I could eat because we lived off the land. And you mentioned, uh, like, uh, canning your food. As my mother was an avid canner of food, is that you can during the summer so that you can survive during the winter. Well, she also, she was, she was the best cook, but now I'm kind of re revisiting that. Was she a good cook or was I just hungry? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, and I, and I go back, she must have been a good cook because the food that I, she taught me a lot of things. Matter of fact, being the oldest, see, I'm the oldest of 15. You guys should be have tears in your eyes now. <laughs> because to be the oldest, you know, the very instant that they brought another individual into my house, <laughs> I inherited some responsibility. No authority, but responsibility. And she straightened me out too, is that, you know, and, and I, I appreciate what she said, did for me. But also too, is that she told me is that your siblings are looking up to you. What you do, you know, they, they imitate you. So they kind of, you know, shut me off, but I still was not a saint. You know, because one thing about it too is that on, on the farm that we lived on, we, it, we had everything, uh, but it was hard work and I enjoyed it. But also too is that uh, we had a way of helping each other out. You know, I mean, you mentioned that, 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 that people need something. In those days you didn't, Lock your house. If you happen to go by someone's house too and you want a drink of water, you just go ahead and get it. You want food, you leave a note and take it, you know. But we're getting back to that now too is that my family, when we left uh, Oklahoma in 1952, I really didn't know what to expect in California now because what I read about you California people is that <laughs> you know, it was a gold state. And the way they told your story is that the streets were paved with gold. Everybody had a, a money tree. As a kid, I wanted to see this. Because if you live in the country where I live at, is that there's only two uh, deals on the road. Is that either gravel or it's dirt road. You know, and to see a street paved with gold, I wanted to see that because you're talking about almost at the end of times. You know, where we supposed to be going. But when I got to California, is that we got off the Santa Fe Railroad. Incidentally, I mean, we left at midnight. You know what that means, don't you? It means that we almost had to slip away. You know, because if you are a sharecropper, they, you have a tab. And you can't leave until that tab is paid. You can also, if you are not uh, strong enough or educated enough, you will never get off the tab. But my, my grandfather got off of it because at the age of three, 
my mother taught me how to read and write using the King James Version of the, of the Bible. You know, so I was like, they said that he's a half smart kid. But it actually was an insult too because when you say I'm half of something, I'm also half of something else. So if you say I'm half smart, you're saying I'm half dumb too. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, 1945, my uncle came back from fighting in the war. He was in the Army Battle of the Birds, but he came back and he was going to California. That's why I heard about California. Well, we was going to be coming next as soon as we paid the tab. My grandfather had the last uh, wagon load of cotton to go in there, so I went into town with him. It, like I said, it took us a whole half a day to get there. We get there, he weighs it up, man gives him a piece of paper, and then he takes it over to the county store. That's where you have your tab. The figure that he gave uh, my grandfather, he gave it to, he gave it to the storekeeper, and the guy says to my, my grandfather, he says, Amos, that's my grandfather's name. He said, you almost got off the tab. Well, being a nosy kid, half smart kid too, is that when he put the book down, I went over to look at it. And I saw the paper that my grandfather gave him and in in what was on his book. This was a larger figure. <laughs> well, you know, and I didn't have to figure. I, I, I figured in my head that he owed my grandfather $75. So he told my grandfather, he says, Amy, you almost got off the book. He said, if you have another year like this, you know, you, 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 you'll be getting off the book. I told my grandfather, no, I said, he owes you some money. He owes you $75. <laughs> so, when he said that, my grandfather walked over to us that, and you all don't understand my grandfather. He was a quiet guy, but you didn't mess with him. Yep. As a matter of fact, the, the, the guys they called night riders, they didn't come to Texas, to Oklahoma, when, we left, when they left there. They didn't come because, you know, he didn't take no stuff. But he asked the guy, he says, he says are, you, are you sure, bro? I said, yeah. And I showed him, I said, your figure and his figure. I said, you're subtracted, and he owes you money. Then the guy asked me, he says, do you want to leave it on the book? My grandfather said, no. He said, because I have two other families that I have to get uh, share this money with. So he, he got the money back, you know, and on the way back, he kept looking at me. He said, bub, you know that stuff? I said, yeah, 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 Papa, I know that. He says, let's stop at this store here. And back in those days, if you went back there in my generations, that the treat of the day was have that, they had that stick bologna round, <laughs> and they had the uh, saltine crackers. They didn't call it saltine, they said crackers. He, and you need some red soda water. Yep. So that's what he got me. But he had, I, in the store, I saw something else I'd never seen before. It was marshmallows. <laughs> I, you know, I, I asked the guy, I said, what is all? He said, marshmallow, you know, what is marshmallow, you know, really? So my grandfather said, you won't want it? Yeah, he so said, instead of getting a, a little bag, he got a big bag. And he gave it to me, and on the way back, I ate the bologna, the crackers, and, <laughs> and I was eating those marshmallows, and I, I mean, I, I really made my, I, I need to stop because I need to pull over, you know. <laughs> but to this day, the only reason I eat marshmallows today is if you put them on a uh, baked sweet potato. I love them like that, you know. But anyway, uh, getting back to how I'm getting into farming too is that I, my parents told me, <laughs> my parents told me when I come to California is that they're poor education. You need to get away from farming because of the legacy of it. You know, you need to get your education, get your job so you can pay, you know, you can take care of your family. Well, I did that. But like I said, there's, there's something they call DNA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it's in you, also too, is if you're spiritual, you know that each and every one of us here for a reason. Mm -hmm. We have something to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and some people are lucky to find out early in their life, you know. But me, I went through high school, went through college, was drafted into the military. As a matter of fact, sidetrack. <laughs> I went to electronic school over here at Treasure Island. I used to come to Berkeley, where they had a free speech area, yeah. and I used to, I used to listen to uh, Huey Newton, the Black Panthers, how they how they would talk, and also a, a gentleman named Mario Savio, mm -hmm. and they impressed me too because they would sit up there and they take an issue and they would actually go from pro to con on it. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned a lot. You know, so you know Berkeley, you know, it, it has it has an attachment to me. 
But anyway, if the DNA engine, because I went, they went to college, got my degree, got out of military, got married, and I bought five acres there. I'm going to be my dream home mom. Well, we started uh, growing vegetables for myself, and then the neighborhood said they like it. So guess what I did? A dumb thing that I did, too, is that after I retired from the telephone company, I bought 20 acres, 40 acres. It's literally like jumping out of the skillet into the fire, <laughs> you know. Because, you know, but it's a lucky thing, too, because if you were raised on a farm, those things will come back to you. If you're taught something, it comes back to you. All you have to do is refine it. And you're right, we went through it, and I probably want to, I probably better stuff this up, because I, I could go on and on. But, but, but I'm going to try to make it fast, too, is that where we are today is that uh, I started farming, too, you know, raising family, I mean, raising a family and also, too. My kids, incidentally, they don't want to be farmers. You know, but I have a granddaughter too I'm working on. She's a master gardener, so she's coming back to take it over. But, but also you, you, you find out something too is that if you look back over, over time because you are what you eat yes. health-wise. If you eat healthy, you'll be healthy and hopefully you act healthy, you know. And that's where we are now too is that uh, we have to get back to it. I've got a term now they call regenerative. Whether you know it or not, it's you're going back to Dr. John Washington Carver. Yes. What he did, was doing, you know, we need to get back to that because I think the nutritional value of stuff that we're growing now is not what it was back in my day. You know, not only is the soil being depleted, but also stuff we're growing doesn't have the nutritional value. That's why right now is that when I was coming up, as far as spice, all we had was... Uh, Salt and black pepper and vanilla extract for making the cakes, you know. But now I, I, I challenge you to go to a store and they got four or five hours of spices. You can take that spice and make shoe leather taste good. You know? But also, too, is that it's like the medicine we take, there are side effects. You know, so, but. If we get back to what we were supposed to do initially is that we need to eat what is grown from the earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even though now is that in order to feed people, we have to go to another medium, mm. you know? So that's okay too, but I think that we need to be careful. Yeah. Uh, I got into farming and I realized too is that to me it was something spiritual. Yes. The book tell me that I came from dirt. Mm. So when I take care of the dirt, it takes care of me. Yes. But, but, but also, too, is that as we move forward on this thing, is that we get into what I call equity. Mm -hmm. Man don't make dirt. Man don't make water. But man wants to control it. He want to dictate who, who gets to, to eat and who gets to drink water. And I think that we, sh we need to be speaking up. We need to say something now is that as you know, I live in Fresno. Mm -hmm. The Tulare Basin has reclaimed this, this area. At one time, the Tulare Basin was uh, the biggest water collection of water this side of Mississippi. 100 year cycles, it, 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 uh, Earth seemed to, to reclaim what so is. We need to make a decision, too, is that as a farmer, do I have to go through some more drought years? Or we'd be proactive and try to get uh, recycle, uh, re uh, furnish the aquifer so that we have water. About five years ago, is that my wells went dry because the water table dropped. And you know this is if you're a farmer, you have land, you have no water. You're actually not a farmer. You're a landowner with the pro with the balance due uh, or a payment due at the end of the month. You're hurting. And if you can take to the next phase too, is if you're a, a, a farmer of color you got some real problem. Because as a small farmer, stuff like you don't recover. Big farmer can go one year without making revenue and he can survive. Small farmer can't do it. We miss one season, we're out of it because the stuff that I'm planting today is the expense for my next crop. Right. So, but anyway, I think I'm gonna quit, right? <laughs> <laughs>
Mr. Mr. Scott, we could we could truly listen to you all day. Um, but I want to jump off from a point uh, that you made um, talking about your daughter potentially coming back and and being a land steward. We've seen this trend over the last several years, maybe a, you know the last decade, where there are a lot of younger black folks who are coming back to the land, who are reclaiming the land of their ancestors, who are buying land and creating farms. And I guess I'd love to hear, because we talk a lot about the statistics, but uh, anecdotally, can the three of you talk about the challenges of being a farmer entrepreneur and how you might address you know, some of those barriers and challenges that you do face. Challenges. I'll start, that's okay. <laughs> um, well, for me currently, it's my, I'm aging. <laughs> I don't know how you still out there, <laughs> like doing what you do, so you're doing it big. But I mean, it's like my body, I feel, you know, my body getting more, I don't know, fragile, I guess. Um, so that's kind of my current initial challenge, I guess. But outside of that, like I, I'm an, I've been an urban farmer. I haven't been a rural farmer um, per se. I grew up in rural farms and things like that. And I think, and then I've learned from people like you, Mr. Scott, you know, about, you know, the discrimination that occurs in <clears throat> spaces like um, in the rural spaces where people are growing um, and, and, and black, growing wild black, <laughs> as it were. Mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity to have, um, to, I kind of basically walked in and kind of took it, you know, was just like, nah, I did. I basically did. I took it. <laughs> I was just like, oh, this is mine. <laughs> and all these other black and brown people out here, this is theirs. And, and that's kind of the stand I made, um, becoming an urban farmer. I start, <laughs> thanks. <clears throat> I started growing food for my family because nobody was giving me anything. I couldn't afford to have all of the delicious, amazing produce served by Berkeley Bull and Whole Foods and all the other places that you're like, oh, it's organic. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> not for everyone. It's not, it's not for everyone, you know? And it's like, and that, that whole thing. So I feel like, yeah, challenges you asked. Um, I'm hella mad right now. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just like, access. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, my children grew up on welfare. Where's my daughter? Dharma, you still here? Where are you at? Way back there, why? That's my, that's my middle child. <laughs> she did not. Anyway, um, I, my children were raised on welfare. I had to learn how. And I think if it weren't for a few magical people that surprisingly and magically showed up in my life, I would not have learned how to grow my own food. I mean, I, I knew my, my relatives grew their own, but they didn't teach me, per se. They didn't, per se, teach me. So access, I think, is probably the greatest uh, challenge, um, I think, in our communities of color, particularly, and um, young people in, in particular as well. Is they're, they're like, here, it's packaged, it's Cheetos, it's this, it's that, it's the other thing, but so, so education around how to have awareness of why it's important to stay connected to the planet, to the earth, to the soil, to the dirt. Why it's important to actually know how to like gather, gather your wits about you and grow some stuff. My son, he, he, he basically protested the entire time we <laughs> were I was running Spiral Gardens with Daniel, his father. <clears throat> and my son was like, I don't like this garden stuff, and I don't like bugs, and I don't like dirt, and I don't like dirt. <laughs> but last year, he's 19 now. Last year, he grew his first whole entire chili pepper crop. There it is. All by himself. 
We didn't touch it. We were just like, oh, okay, I'll see you out there doing your stuff, <laughs> like gardening and things. It was so beautiful. But without, you know, just having an example, I think, of, of us doing stuff out there on the ground, in the dirt, in the soil, building compost, building all the, saving seeds, all the things. He might not have ever got to that point, you know, so I'm grateful for, you know, just everything my ancestors taught me, even if I wasn't even trying to, like, understand or learn from them, and then going forward, having my children and wanting to grow food so that they could have access to that nutrition, that nourishment, and so, and then my son. Oh, 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 I'll say this last thing, sorry. And on this note, <clears throat> all of my children are foodies. They are all farmers now. They're all herbalists as well. <laughs> they, like, they got skills. So yeah, holler at Dharma. Do you get to at the later? Thank you for asking. Sorry, that was only a long. So no, that was that was beautiful. And real quick, we, you you touched on this, and we know that in urban centers, there are so many people in historically marginalized communities who face innumerable physical and economic and geographic barriers to accessing healthy, fresh, affordable, and cultural appropriate food. Yes. Yeah, from yes. you know the exorbitant housing costs, exorbitant food costs, all these things. And I love that your you know, kind of entree into gardening and farming started from this personal lens. And you understood that it had to be about addressing the larger structural issues as well. I mean, the, like the, the, it's in the title of um, Spiral Gardens, Community Food, um, yes. what is it, Community Food? Food Security Project. Food Security Project, yes. right? Can yes. you just talk about that kind of lens of moving beyond just the kind of personal um, impulses, but understanding the role that this work that you were doing in Berkeley would play on impacting the local community and beyond? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so Spiral Gardens is all about community food security, food justice, food sovereignty and education is built deeply into everything that we do at Spiral Gardens. And so for 18 years, I was a part of helping to grow um, Spiral Gardens, not only the, the nursery and the community farm itself, but also the community. Um, that's been my whole jam. And it's, it's still what I do now. I'm teaching at USF and that's, um, now I'm happy to teach young people how to go forward in the world and think about food justice and sovereignty and access. And then, um, so I feel like education is really important. You know, Bryant has taught at Spiral Gardens. We're pretty lucky. <laughs> he came and <laughs> taught how to cook from the garden. You know, whatever we had growing in the garden, in the farm, um, Bryant came and accessed all of those ingredients and, and taught a bunch of really, he taught a bunch of people how to do that, you know, and so learning to actually use the food and, and ingredients that you grow, that's not something that, they don't just, I mean, you can watch YouTube videos all day long, but just sitting in the presence of a great one, like this one, you know, and actually getting that information is so important, and it's like, and looking at this black man right here, how many, how many people do we get to see you know, this person right here, this black man, you know, actually scholarly teaching everyone everywhere. It's like, it's amazing and rare. And they try to shut it down, but they can't. <laughs> they can't. They cannot. You know, and I'm just grateful for the opportunity to have teachers like Bryant coming to Spiral Gardens. Um, we've had fermenters. We've had plant dyes, you know, teaching from how to grow mushrooms, or like all kinds of how to build soil, how to, how to build a raised bed, you know, just like we try to, and, and all of these classes are free. And that's, I think, what makes the difference, you know, when <laughs> you did think about the ways that they charge for permaculture design courses, excuse me, stop it. These are indigenous practices that have been carried on since time immemorial, why? <laughs> I get, we can't capitalize on this stuff anymore. It's like it's nonsense, so. Free the land!
fun, the education, feed the people, <laughs> all things. Go. So Pandora, um, I'd love for you to expound upon this concept of having an Afro-Indigenous farm, um, especially given the geographical context in which you have an Afro-Indigenous farm. So you're in Sebastopol, which doesn't have a lot of Afro-Indigenous people. Um, it's a very white area. And so I'd love to just know about your decision to have the farm there. Maybe you don't need to get, I know, I kind of know about this, so I don't know if you need to get too into that, but um, the approach, the impact that you're having on community, the invitation um, for our people to come up on the farm and learn and grow and contribute to what you're doing, and just some of the challenges that you face as a black woman, land steward, and entrepreneur. Um, because I think, you know, oftentimes it, it looks good on the outside, you know, they're like Earthseed, Octavia Butler, you like selling, um, you're one of the main, aren't you one of the like biggest suppliers of Asian pears in this region? And so, you know, when I think about just one kind of coming to your work through a lecture, through your website, I think it, you know, it looks all shiny and fun, but it's, it's a lot of challenges. So can you just talk about it? It all. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And also, I just want to, again, honor Kanchan, because growing up in Berkeley, or being adulting in Berkeley, seeing Spiral Gardens really was something else that inspired me. And like she said, seeing people that, just the simple thing is seeing people that look like you. It's very revolutionary. <laughs> um, so Earthseed Farm, we say it is um, where environmental education meets ecological design rooted in Afro-Indigenous wisdom mm -hmm. at an Afro-Indigenous oasis. We just decided to add that because um, I want to first honor Octavia Butler. Y'all know who Octavia Butler is? Correct? So weird because like five years ago, if I would have said this, it was like nothing. But now I think with, she's really having her time. So let's again honor the people while they're here. Yes. She is now an ancestor. Um, but her book, Parable of the Sower, I actually read it in seminary in New, York, New York, in New York 20 years ago. And when I read it, something in me was like, I'm Earthseed. Yeah. Yeah. And one day, I will be doing Earthseed. I, again, you all know when someone writes a book that says what you needed to say? I didn't want I, I my- I remember your email was like earthseed at yahoo.com 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I had my email, earthseed72 at gmail.com. <laughs> it's been that for 25 years, it's crazy. Um, the crazy thing about Earthseed is I was like, I don't necessarily want everything in Earthseed because that book is also kind of crazy, <laughs> which we ended up living out. But um, the beauty of Earthseed Farm, where we are now, we bought a turnkey organic orchard. So a place that was already has 4,000 fruit trees. It's a you pick. And so my entire life has been this whole question of, you know, we are nature working. Like, we are the earth. Yes. So being in Sonoma County, teaching permaculture, which I want to apologize for permaculture. Um, you can do whatever you want. There was never places that we could go and that we were the teachers or that we were not feeling weird or some kind of way or somebody touching our hair. Y'all know the whole things. And so as a permaculture teacher in Sonoma County, the opportunity came to take this farm over. And it was it's myself and, and other people that are part of the Black Permaculture Network, we were like, it's, the time is now. And if I would have done it in a place where there are black people, we wouldn't be in California. <laughs> like a place that has an orchard, an organic orchard with 4,000 fruit trees, that there's a robust African-American. Again, we've been pushed out of so many places. But I do want to say Sonoma County, in their weird way, has welcomed us. <laughs> Meaning they've written articles and stuff about us. <laughs> But most important about Earthseed Farm is that we are not there for other people. We really right. are there so that black people can come home. Say it again. And Say learn it again. who we are. And it happens to be an environmental education center on a farm. So our goal is not to be the best farmers because that's one of the biggest challenging. Agriculture sucks, especially how it treats the people that are growing our food right now in Sonoma County. The, specifically the brown communities. 
not just from Mexico, but several countries, being paid $13 an hour, $14 an hour. But here's the problem. It's because farmers don't have any money. Yeah. <laughs> They're paying people because they don't have the money. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to charge for stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reason also that Earthseed is not trying to compete in this agricultural game, because we will lose. We are clearly a nonprofit, and I write grants so that our staff make 80K. I'll say it because we, but here's the other thing. We can't just farm. We have to be mission driven. Because if I depended on our wholesale partners, we sell to Whole Foods, Stanford, we might make $150,000 a year, y'all. That's with 4,000 fruit trees. So I would say for those of us up and coming, yes, we can be doing farming, but we also have to be creative. You kind of have to be Renaissance people. Yep. Every day. We got Black camp, black camp that we're launching. So black people will be, it's, well, I'm not supposed to say this. It's for black people, but my lawyer said I'm not supposed to say this. But it's, <laughs> black camp is glamping for us by us. You can come if you have a black person with us. Please don't tell anybody I said this. Um, we have the you pick. We got, you know, you got to be doing all of these things because right now the agricultural system is not set up to honor the farmers. The stewards that are harvesting and growing the food or the soil. So part of our journey at Earthseed is Afro-Indigenous permaculture, which is basically understanding how have people of African ancestry throughout the diaspora always stewarded ourselves in the land. So yes, we're practicing permaculture, but permaculture just took all that stuff from indigenous people from all over the world. That's right. So the two Australian men that created permaculture, they didn't create anything. They nope. correlated it into a training <clears throat> that is ours. That's right. So I just want to say all of y'all are welcome at Earthseed. We're launching our um, website on Saturday. The biggest challenge, I'm going to say it again, is how horrible the agricultural system treats the people that work in it. Agreed. So I am doing everything in my power. That's really my focus now. The hardest thing is hearing people talk about this beautiful Latinx community, how they do. These are the people that are feeding us. Yes. So I want to honor them and all of the people that have stewarded land in Sonoma County because we're just following in, in their legacy. Mm -hmm. And the easiest part about it is when people come, just being on the land. We have something called Black to the Land. I tell people, there's no curriculum. You know what the curriculum is? Be black on the land. <laughs> <laughs> because they know land. We People are like, why? I'm like, nope, just come and stop. <laughs> Sit under a tree. Sorry, I'm like spitting. I'm so upset. Word, word to Trisha Hersey and that minister. <laughs> well, Let's look, jump in. Can and I'd be jump remiss if I didn't say that when you go visit Earthseed Farm, they got the fly built in swimming pool and hot tub as well. Um, cool. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> I was there. That was the other thing. Let I just... wanted to be bougie and beautiful <laughs> as everybody else. I didn't want to buy Shim Sham Farm. I want the most beautiful, <laughs> gorgeous. So black people, we all stressed, we need some beauty. Yes. <laughs> so you'll drink some persimmon juice, you'll sit in the pool, and be black and beautiful on land. Yeah. That is Earthsea. Hello. I was there. I can attest. Absolutely. What are trying to do? I'm trying to get Papa to come. So and and pet come Pandora. And nothing. Pandora. I was not talking about you when I said that about the permaculture oh, stuff. Oh, no, I know, I know. I know. You know that I'm... No, you, I okay, do know, but right, permaculture cool. really does suck. Clear. So. <laughs> What's with the Australians? Not if you teach it. Because, <laughs> you know, I didn't even know that that was the origins of permaculture as we know it. Peter Singer, who's seen as the kind of, you know, the main philosophical scholar who've drove, driven, you know, the tenets of veganism. Same thing, Australian. That's why people associate uh, veganism with like white suburban kind of upper middle class practices or, you know, urban gentrified. And it's, it's ours. like, that's We're ours taking as it all well. back. Plant, plant centered, plant forward. So, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, Mr. Scott, I would love to hear, because the first time I met you was at Freedom Farmers Market, a black run, black owned farmers market in Oakland, started by uh, Gail My Myers, farmer, anthropologist, uh, poet. Um, I'd love for you to talk about, um, you know, any challenges that you faced over the arc of being a farmer, but I think specifically I'd love to hear more about just what it looks like bringing your products to market and, you know, promoting and just ensuring that you can actually sell much of the uh, produce that you're growing. 
You guys have got all day? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's been an experience too, is that I can tell you that when I first when I first started going into farming, too, that was some obstacle too, is that because that was farmers markets that I couldn't get into. Right. Uh even though they didn't sell my products. Uh products that's uh was uh, uh, our legacy crops, uh, mustard greens, stuff like that. They wasn't there. So if I let me in, I wouldn't be in competition. You know, I'd bring added, added flavor to it. But it's amazing how things are turning around now, too, is that I get a call every day wanting me to send a, a black farmer to participate in the farmer's market. <laughs> we don't have them. I have to tell them we don't have them. The, st the stats that you saw on that too is that in California, that's about 80 to 100,000 farmers in California. Black farmers make up uh, probably maybe less than the cow, but a little over 500. I think it's improved since then because uh, thanks to Urban Garden, thanks also to that the, some of the uh, media has put an, uh, emphasis on what has happened to the black farmers. We stirred up a lot of interest and uh, a lot of young people want to come back. But like I said, our young people, they're smart, they're intelligent people. We live in a world that's uh, where we uh, worship money. Everybody wants money and enough is not enough. Well, young kids, I mean, we, we train them, we, we, we do, you need money, you get money. So it's hard to get them into farm because first of all, I say farming, but I'd, I'd like to upgrade that too because farming kind of scares young people. They know it's uh, hard labor and it's also equated with uh, slavery. So, like virginity, we'll use the word agriculture. <laughs> if I say agriculture, then that holds up the whole spectrum. If you look at California, that's the leading uh, industry in California is that it's uh, billions and billions of dollars come from agriculture. As a matter of fact, they say we feed the world. You know, but like I said, you look at the representation. My people played a tremendous part in getting this country where it is today. Yeah. Okay, uh, there's two reasons why we got away from it. First of all, it didn't pay. Second is also, thanks to George, uh, Booker T. Washington, he says, uh, you know, you, you need to get education, stuff like that. <laughs> so my parents told me, you know, like I said, that you get an education, get away from farming. So you can get you a good job. Well, I did it, I come back. But where we are now is that I'll come back this time too is that we're looking at equity. If I mention to you reparation, a lot of people get scared. You know, when you look at that, you know, is that to me, if you're trying to make up for something, some past offense like that, is that when do you stop with the zeros? Because you, 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 you can't. You can't, you can't buy your way out of that. But the thing that I'm, I'm looking for today is that equity. With equity, that means that I'm not looking for a handout. I'm looking for a hand up. And before I go any further too, is that California is one of the most diverse states in this union. The diversity is what made this country great. Each and every one of them played a part in it. We had COVID, which scared people. To me, the next thing that's going to happen to us is the food. Not only the quality of food, but also the availability of food. And that's where people of color, especially blacks, we have to come back, and especially young people, they don't have the baggage I have. They don't know what I know but they're smart enough that they can take what I know and, and take it further. They can uh, not repeat the things that we did, with, that we, that we uh, committed. And like it says that in California, we can raise something like four, maybe three or 400 different crops. And that's due to our diversity. Each one of them supplies us with what we need in order to make us healthy. And I'm not gonna tell you my age, I'm 28, but don't, don't. <laughs> But anyway, I, I think it's a credit to my to our mother. It's my brother there. It's credit to my mother too. Is that she fed us healthy? She knew what to feed us. They knew what plant too, because like I said, her mother was African, so they knew 
people who come from those countries, they know the, the, the different crops that helps you, that kills whatever ails you. Mm -hmm. It's like, like I said, people, uh, you look at uh, uh, collard greens. Collard greens lowers your cholesterol. Cabbage, a lot of people like cabbage. Cabbage, is kind of, it, it cleans you out. The fatty tissue that clings to your inside, it cleans it out. Naturally, a lot of people don't like okra, but okra is good to you. Yeah. It's good for you if you know how to prepare it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like at this time, Terry, too, is that before I not forget it, too, is that the farmers, the chefs, and the vintners, and the other people, we need to get together. Yeah. Because like I can say is that, especially the chef, you can dictate what I grow, you know? Because you prepared it, you 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 put the value added to it, you know. And the things that you do with the food that I grow, it really amazes amazes me. Yeah. You know, but butternut squash too is that the gentleman over there in, in San Francisco. He, he was he was a chef. He owns a restaurant. He made butternut soup. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> but now the things that we can do with it too. But like I say, getting back to it is that. I think that we need to be serious about a lot of things, and we need to be vocal. Yep. Yeah. Now, Mr. Man, uh, Dr. Mandela said this, is that when the good people remain silent, mm -hmm. the bad people get louder and they multiply. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's where we are today in this nation. Yes. But I think food is going to be the, come, the panacea for us. Mm -hmm. Because when you, we eat together, we're at peace, right? When we are taking care of those who can that are hungry, in the United States, why do we have a uh, food desert? Why do we have people starving to death? The United States is the most advanced country on this earth. We should not have any hunger. But like it says, that because of money, yeah. we do things like that. So we need to get back to actually not only taking care of the soil, and the soil is something that you have to be careful about. Yes. Yeah. You know, because it, it's kind of like the water that we was taking out. We took water out of the valley. We didn't put nothing back. Mm -hmm. We expect Mother Nature to take care of, but you don't mess with Mother Nature. Yeah. Like it says that if Father Time don't get you, Mother Nature sure will. Yeah. So um, we have one of one final part of the presentation, which is a performance. But um, I'm just immensely grateful for the three of you answering the call being in partnership with me. Can we give a big round of applause for our brilliant farmer panelists? Yeah. So as our so our performers are now going to transition to the stage. And I just want to say that um, the sacred larder work that I'm um, continuing to work on, as I mentioned, I'm working with a fabricator, um, Matt Austin, down in California, in um, LA, and he's building out an eight-foot-tall pantry that you know we see in museums and galleries, but not necessarily this one. He's drawing up the plans so that if we're invited to a museum, a gallery, a community space we can work with the host to actually bring in a local woodworker, to potentially source local wood to replicate that model, to have farmers, chefs, elders, community members bring in their own fam family favorite uh, pickles and preserves and uh, ferments to populate the um, pantry. But in the spirit of social practice art, I really see the work that I'm doing is starting the piece and inviting the community in to finish it. And this is exactly, this embodies what I see happening. You know, having the artwork be the kind of like pull factor that will then, we can create all types of programming around it. So bringing in local chefs, bringing in local farmers, bringing in local community activists, um, health activists, all type of people who are um, stakeholders in creating a more healthful, just and sustainable system, food system and really building this movement on the ground. So, um, so I want to invite up our two performers. And I just want to say that, um, just give you a little context about this performance. When I was working on the Sacred Larder piece, I was really inspired by my maternal family's 
um, artistic lens through which they saw the world, my grandmother's pantry, and that song, Glory, Glory, the one that I recited at the beginning of my talk. And so I decided that I wanted to do kind of an updated version on it, my take on this song, thinking about this whole concept of Sankofa that really drives so much of the work that I do. And so I started building a song with my guy, Joshua Gabriel, who's one of my longtime collaborators. We've been friends for over two decades, and he designed a logo for my, my um, not-for-profit, Be Healthy. He designed a logo for my um, publishing imprint, Four Color Books at Penguin Random House. I used to like, He's a brilliant musician. He's a like polymath. He's a painter. He's an illustrator. He's a trained graphic designer, and he's also this brilliant like performer who used to go around the underground in New York and like be spinning records while playing the harmonica and playing the guitar and playing the bongos all at once. <laughs> and when Josh and I um, met, we just fell in love. We just loved hip hop, and we just immediately took to each other. And I just believed in his work so much that I would literally just follow him around and record him, you know, so that he has these archives. And we just have been collaborating for the longest time. But we did this um, version of this song, Burden Down. And then um, um, Fred DeWitt, who is a former MFA student and um, artist, who's one of my studio mates, he came into my um, studio, I played the song for him, and he encouraged me to really think about how I could bring, bring my grandmother's presence more deeply into the piece. And I took that to heart. So I called my mom, and I convinced her to embody my grandmother um, you know, as she was at the stove cooking and singing. I flew to Alabama and recorded my mom in the kitchen when she was cooking and then um, gave it to JG and we incorporated that into the song. So as we're leaving, I will play the song for you. It's on Spotify um, if you wanna like really listen to it deeply later. Um, but right now I'm gonna invite um, JG and my mom to the stage um, and they're gonna be doing an acoustic version of Burn Down. So. <laughs> I'll start by introducing my mother, Beatrice Terry, um, who is a retired registered nurse, the mother of two children, a daughter who is a physician, and a son who is a Renaissance man. <clears throat> Can I say that about myself? No. <laughs> um, and the nana to two loving, brilliant, and beautiful granddaughters. As a retiree, she is very active in her faith and local communities. Um, serving as Eucharistic minister, lector, and cantor at St. Joseph's Catholic Church and helping as an active volunteer in the Downtown Rescue Mission in Huntsville, Alabama. She's also the financial secretary for the local chapter of the Knights of Peter Claver, Ladies Auxiliary, and the largest historically African-American Catholic organiza lay organization in the U.S. Beatrice is an active member of her church's choir, and she served as a minister of music. She was born and raised in South Memphis, Tennessee, along with seven brothers and two sisters in a family of gifted musicians, all inspired by their father, Edward Bryant, who founded and led a traveling gospel quartet, the Four Stars of Harmony. Joshua Gabriel, birth name Joshua Gabriel Lunsk, is a New York-based artist, musician, and graphic designer whose work combines drawing, video production, murals, and performance. JG updates the aesthetic of psychedelia to create a hybrid space in which a mythologized version of his own <laughs> ego <laughs> I know him too well. <laughs> a mythologized version of his own ego, constructed a variable disposable persona, is at the center. Drawing on his experience as a visual artist and musical performer in New York and the New York underground, his work leans towards spectacle, sketching on sac sacred objects and ready-mades, projecting onto walls, and combining the abstract and figurative in a riot of color. Born and raised in Philadelphia, JG received his BFA from the Tyler School of Art and his MFA from Brooklyn College. Joshua Gabriel has created a large-scale mural throughout New York City and is exhibited and performed throughout the United States. St. State Street, a collaborative project he formed with me in Brooklyn during the early aughts, capitalizes on our creative energy via film, design, and music projects. So, JG, Ma, go for it. <laughs> on 
the phone? Hmm. Got the phone for the lyrics? Yes. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. I feel better, so much better, since I laid my burdens down. I feel better, so much better, since I laid my burdens down. Feel like shouting, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down, feel like shouting, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down, glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down, burden down, Lord, burdens down, Lord. Since I laid my burdens down, burdens down, Lord, burdens down, Lord. Since I laid my burdens down. I feel better, so much better, since I laid my burdens down. I feel better, so much better, since I laid my burdens down. was so good, I forgot I was supposed to come up here. <laughs> I want to thank, please join me in thanking Bryant Terry and all of today's panelists. Join me in thanking all of the Abolition Democracy Fellows for an incredible series. If you've been here before, you know how brilliant this has been. I can't believe it. We're, we're, we're actually ending early. First time, whole season. Um, but that means there's more time to fellowship outside, um, and we look forward to chatting with you. Thank you again. Have a beautiful day.